Stimați și onorați domnii profesori, doamnelor și domnilor, suntem la 29-a conferință a ATN-ului. Pentru noi, pentru noi cei care construim acest proiect, este un lucru pozitiv și încurajator. Reușim în vreo patru ani, aproape patru ani, să facem cu o densitate onorabilă anuală aceste conferințe care îmi doresc să fie omologate ca un loc în care elita autentică românească să se poată manifesta, un loc în care elita europeană și elita mondială să poată să prezinte proiectele lor. Cred că am reușit, am, în seara aceasta conferențează un laureat al Premiului Nobel, profesor Jean Marilen, Premiul Nobel Chimie 1987. Este al cincilea laureat al Premiului Nobel care urcă pe scena Ateneului Român. Venerabila noastră instituție, care împlinește anul acesta 150 de ani de când funcționează Societatea Filarmonică Română. Și sunt 130 de ani de când clădirea aceasta, care e un monument UNESCO, a devenit, a reușit să se impună ca simbol al spiritualității românești. Vreau să mulțumesc în primul rând domnului academician Mircea Dumitru, care este, de fapt, părintele acestui proiect, la acestei conferințe de astăzi. Filarmonica este onorată să aibă acest parteneriat cu Universitatea Bucureșteană, o instituție care, în afara performanței didactice, în lumea noastră de astăzi, așa de laxă, a reușit să impună un model de moralitate rarisim în spațiul balcanic. Și meritul este al conducerii Universității București. Conferința privește o temă care, pentru specialiști, va fi o adevărată revelație. Eu, ne fiind de specialitate, oricum nu mă pot pronunța, dar modul în care a fost omologată performanța profesorului Len spune totul. O să-l rog pe domnul academician Andru să prezinte un scurt laudatio al invitatului nostru. Mulțumesc în mod cu totul special domnului profesor Len că a acceptat să fie astă seară aici, la București. Vă mulțumesc! Bună seara! Ateneul Român este mai mult decât sediul filarmonicii naționale, mai mult decât un loc în care săptămânal au loc concerte, încă de la înființarea lui a fost gândit ca un loc în care se, se întâmplă mai multe lucruri. Conferințe pentru publicul larg, expoziții și originele pinacotecii naționale sunt de altfel în această clădire, pentru că ulterior s-a mutat și s-a dezvoltat în muzeul, în muzeul Național. O dovadă a faptului că această instituție este o instituție simbol pentru întreaga cultură românească, înțelegând prin aceasta și uh, științele, este faptul că pe această cupolă sunt înscrise nu numai artele, dar și numele uh, și chimia, și fizica, și matematica. Este un loc în care se întâlnesc toate elementele definitorii pentru spiritualitatea românească. Conferințele care se organizează de către Ateneul Român sunt pentru un public larg. Așa au fost gândite de la uh, începuturile acestei instituții, mai ales după 1888, când clădirea a fost uh, inaugurată. 
a găzduit nu numai conferințe, nu numai, scuzați-mă, concerte care au intrat în istoria acestei clădiri și care au făcut ca această scenă să fie o scenă importantă pentru cultura românească și pentru muzica românească, dar și prin faptul că pe această scenă au pășit mari personalități și ale științei. A spus domnul director că domnul profesor Jean-Marie Len este al cincilea laureat al Premiului Nobel care prezintă o conferință. Mai e ceva de spus pentru că în sală sunt în mod sigur și elevi de liceu și este bine că au venit. Că de profesorul Len a creat o ramură a chimiei. Așa cum știți că existau chimia organică, chimia anorganică, chimia fizică, chimia analitică, cataliza și așa mai departe, în urmă cu aproximativ 50 de ani s-a creat o nouă ramură a chimiei care nu exista și care a schimbat modul nostru de gândire în calitate de chimiști. Ni s-a schimbat modul de gândire, ni s-a schimbat limbajul și uh, prin ceea ce veți auzi astăzi veți înțelege că profesorul Len a împins chimia tradițională către înțelegerea profundă a mecanismelor uh, vieții. Le spuneam studenților mei și am mai spus și astăzi o dată și țin foarte mult la acest lucru, este faptul că au marele privilegiu de a se întâlni cu cel care a creat un domeniu care este ilustrat de un curs care se, chem, care se cheamă Chimia Supramoleculară și care se ține în anul 3 la uh, Facultatea de Chimie. Este marele privilegiu de a asista la un curs și de a cunoaște pe creatorul acelui domeniu. Uh, Profesorul Lein are legături vechi cu România, este un bun prieten al chimiei din această țară. A venit prima oară în 1969, este membru de onoare al Academiei Române, este doctor honoris causa al Universității Babeș-Bolyai din Cluj, Napoca, al Universității Politehnica din București și de astăzi este doctor honoris causa al Universității noastre. Vă urez o conferință interesantă, sunt sigur că o veți avea să vă bucurați de ceea ce veți auzi și voi da cuvântul distinsului nostru oaspete. So, profesor Len, you have the floor. Thank you very much for uh, accepting the, uh, the invitation to be with us. And I have to go over there. Yeah. No. Can you reduce this? So you have this is the nicest room I have ever been giving a lecture. This room is fantastic, it's the nicest one. And uh, here is also a point where high technology and low technology come together because this screen is very high tech, but you cannot use a laser pointer. So have a low tech, <laughs> which is the baguette, the baton over the conductor here. This is fantastic, huh? This is the way to do it here, you know? I should, it should be a bit bigger, but it's all right. So I would like to thank the director Latineo for having the possibility to give a talk here. We saw my friend Marius Andrew for organizing this and you for coming. And as I said, it is a very impressive room and I will now tell you a story. The story deals with uh, steps towards life. It's an interesting topic, people are excited about, but then comes chemistry. So the enthusiasm goes down a little. No? Chemistry is not in such a good reputation, but I will try to convince you that you are all chemistry. 
But in order to do that, I need to start very, very early, 13.7 billion years ago, here. Our universe started with the Big Bang 13.7 billion years ago. This was very brief. In one second it came here. There was no chemistry, only energy, not even particles. This was the age of physics, no chemistry. Then the universe cooled down quickly and when it reached a temperature low enough to make particles, then to make atoms. Then, after, so here we are three minutes after the Big Bang, and so we have 300,000 years. Chemistry starts about there. When the temperature is low enough to generate atoms, which can go together to make molecules. That's the age of chemistry. But it didn't stop there, of course. Molecules begin, began to be bigger and bigger. They aggregated together, defining compartments with an inside and outside. And this was all the way towards primitive cells. And at some stage, a new property appeared in ways we don't understand yet, but that is why we have steps towards life. And life on Earth started about here and biology, the age of biology started. But it wasn't finished. At least on our planet, it continues further and thinking appeared. This is the property why we are here. Without thinking, we would not be here. For me, thinking is even a more important thing than living. Many things live, but not so many think. And this is steps towards life and towards thought. Now before I continue, I would like to point out one thing. Here, you know this person, the thinker of Rodin. And this thinker sits at the end of the screen. But the end of the screen is not the end of the evolution of the universe. The universe will continue. We are, as we are here, only a point in time and in space. There's lots of space everywhere. Time has been very long, 13 billion years, and it will continue. So if some people say, let's stop the evolution, impossible. The universe does not worry about us, it just continues. And so this screen will be going all around this room and maybe in a few hundred thousand years, somebody will speak here and the screen will be over there, and be there, and there. So it will continue and you cannot stop it. So we better take the resolution that we have to go with it, we have to make use of it, and not try to stop it and be afraid. Afraid, fright has never been a good way of doing things. Now, if you want to try to understand what is some parameters in this evolution, we can consider complexity and information in a region, a given region of the universe, as a parameter. And matter, therefore, as a function of time, has initially been divided, as I said, particles. Then it became condensed. Particles came together to make atoms, molecules, and then they began to be organized. The next step is to be living. At some stage, life appeared by mechanisms we do not yet understand, but you will understand someday, because life is based on molecules, on what we are made of. Then thinking appears. That's a complicated property, and uh, which is even much broader, much more difficult to explain, but we'll get there. And maybe something else. Now this question mark is a complicated thing because it's very difficult for us to think beyond our thinking. I don't know. But you cannot exclude that there is something else there. But it's 
I think very difficult to imagine what it can be. And this is the way towards more and more complex states of matter. Now a big question comes up. What I consider as probably the big question in science. What is it? How does matter become complex? What are the steps by which matter becomes more and more complex? And how can one go from an energy particle to a thinking organism and maybe to even higher forms of complex matter? To give an answer to that question, mankind, at least on our planet and the other planets, there are probably people much more advanced or less advanced than we are. I'm convinced that is life in many places. So, mankind invented science to give an answer to that question. And if I concentrate on three areas of science, physics deals with the laws of the universe. These are the laws on which everything depends, which describe the evolution of the universe and which determine everything how it happens. Biology studies the rules of life. They are not laws, they are rules. What is chemistry doing? You guess it, I guess. It's building the bridge. Chemistry has as a mission to build the bridge between the very general laws of the universe and specific expressions in certain regions like our planet. So how do you go from thermodynamics, relativity, whatever, to an organism like this sitting in this room? This is an important question. But we have an answer to the question. She will say, okay, if you know the answer, you cannot know it because it would be in all magazines. All magazines would say, oh, this is the answer. Yeah, we know the answer, but we know only the word. The question then is, what does this word mean? What is the word? Self-organization. I mean by that, that our universe is structured in such a way that it will lead to organization of matter. So self-organization is this property that our universe has to generate organized matter and out of organized matter, life and thought. But can even claim one thing, that the structure of our universe is such that this is a cosmic imperative. As a conclusion of that, you must say, life is not an accident. Life is a necessity, outcome of the laws and the structure of our universe. Now, how does this self-organization work? I'm not going to give you a lecture, it's a very complicated thing, but at least one can look at it. For the moment, we have still to look at it in two ways, because physicists have not yet been able to provide a general, uh, general answer, because there's still quantum mechanics, there's relativity, and there is difficulty to try to bring these things together. So, self-organization right now can be considered on one hand as the self-organization on the grand scale, the cosmic self-organization, which is the organization of the universe and which I'm not a cosmologist, so I read cosmology and I tell you what my friends I know told me, that after the Big Bang, there were inhomogeneities in density of matter and in the rate of expansion and gravitation Gravitational forces acting on these inhomogeneities led to the formation of stars, galaxies, and so on. But that is not our type of matter, of uh, self-organization. First of all, I should also add to that that we still have a very big unknown. We have self-organization on the cosmic scale, but we know that this matter in the universe, we only know that we are 5% of it, that's complex matter. Our molecular matter is 5%, visible matter is 5% of matter in the universe, according to cosmology. I cannot tell you anything else. 
And this 5% is us and all the other organisms on planets, on stars, on somewhere else in the universe. And I like to call that the matter that matters. Because it's our matter, that's us. The rest is not so interesting for us. And this happens through electromagnetic forces acting on the bricks which make the elements in the universe and combining them and um, going uh, round way, some are better, better meaning thermodynamically better in terms of stability and so on. And Francois Jacob, a uh, great French scientist, a biologist, he said it's tinkering. The organization of matter is tinkering, it's just trying out, and then it goes here, then it goes here, then it can go here, then it goes there. And uh, so these are sort of random structural combinations, but this randomness is still leading to some kind of evolution. So, if we want now to think about how life can have occurred, we must say that before life existed, there was a totally non-living, non-biological evolution. You cannot jump, or it's difficult to imagine, that you jump from atoms directly into living systems. There were steps, 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 more and more complex, closer and closer and closer to the threshold where this property called life appears. And this is even a much more general notion of evolution and of, than the Darwinian. We know about Darwinian evolution. We know that biological organisms evolve in a given way. But before that, there was a totally non-living evolution. And in fact, Darwinian evolution is also chemical, but this you will see later. So, this science I'm talking to you about today is considered as trying to understand the structure of matter, how it is built, and the transformation. How you can transform matter, molecular matter, into different objects, different entities. That is why I am a chemist. Because when you realize, as a youngster, that chemistry has the possibility to mix things and to transform them into something else. It's a fantastic thing. One has to realize that it doesn't, it's not very apparent. You don't see it, but you know it happens and you can study it. But I will tell you in a moment that these are only two features of chemistry. There's another one which is very important, which comes later. Now let's have a little bit of a look at some steps in the development of this science. About 2,500 years ago, there were people in a country not far from here, called Greece, and these were so-called philosophers, scientists, whatever they were, and one of them, Empedocles, tried to say, understand what our matter is made of, made of elements. So he said, okay, there are four elements, fire, air, water, and earth, and the combination of these elements gave properties. Earth and fire is dry, fire and air is hot, air and water is humid, water and earth is cold. Okay, it's a start. It's still very, very simple, but it's a start. Now the thing is that after that, at the same time, there was somebody else had a much deeper insight. That was Democritus. Democritus said that the elements constituting matter, that matter is particulate, and these particles cannot cut down to smaller pieces, atomos, atoms. Now, for a scientist saying that the matter is particularly made of atoms, you have to prove it. You cannot just say it. That is good for a theory, but you have to prove. Now, people say that Democritus had a very good intuition, and I can convince anybody in the street that matter is particulate. Very simple. You take a glass of water, you take a piece of sugar, and you put it in a glass of water. What happens? It dissolves. If matter were continuous, they could not mix like that. There must be particles. If not, it wouldn't mix. And it is said, but doesn't have writings from Democritus, but it is said that his intuition is, was more than intuition, that it comes from these type of observations. The fact that things can intimately mix and disappear into one another. And this is, if that's true, I hope it's true, 
that is a fantastic uh, sort of a far, far sight, far sighted um, way of looking at how the universe is built. The atoms. Then we need also to make order in that. Along the years, chemists, alchemists, began to analyze, to notice that there are things which call elements. They call them zinc of iron, or copper, and so on. <laughs> but it was very chaotic, like a zoo, just a label, huh? no order. And then, in the middle of the 19th century, <coughs> chemists began to realize that there was order. Several people thought about, but the one who made the biggest steps was Dmitri Mendeleev, he looks like a Dostoevsky hero, huh? if you look at him here. Yeah, so he has a nice, well, nice figure, huh? And uh, Dostoevsky, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Mendeleev, <laughs> published in 1869 what I consider one of the most famous and important papers ever written in science. Here it is, in German. German chemistry was the very, very strong chemistry. On the relation, in translation into English, on the relationships between the properties and the atomic weight of the elements. Mitri Mendeleev, Zeitschrift zur Chemie, 1869. And he had re realized that according to their, their atomic number and to their properties, you could classify them, put them into columns and in rows of elements which had similar type of behavior, properties. And sometimes it came out that there was nothing there. So he put a question mark. And he said, when we find it, and it was found, of course. So Mendeleev had a very deep insight, and he was courageous. He was sticking his neck out and saying, look, these things, we don't know them yet, but they will come. And of course, they have been found. So this is a very, very important paper. And I will show you what it is now and what it became. That table is the periodic table of the elements. But nowadays, it looks like this. Now, be careful when you look at it. This is one of the crowning achievements of mankind. Why? If you look at this table from hydrogen to the, with the normal elements, the ones which are natural, uranium. This represents the building blocks of everything in our universe. It is difficult to accept, you know, when a scientist, you have dogma don't exist, but it's inescapable that these are the building blocks of our universe. And why is it like that? Because like a series of, uh, of numbers, is complete. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's nothing between three and four, between four and five, and five and six, and so on. And here you just count. Hydrogen, one proton, one electron. Helium, two, two. Lithium, three, three. So you just count. It's full. So these are the building blocks. Everything in the visible matter in our universe must be made of Living organisms in other regions have the same elements. And this is sort of incredible. No? You sit before a table which tells you that there is something happening a billion light years away. Still that. No? It's this table. I'm sorry, nothing else to tell you about. That's the way it is. And it is really, I, when I see that, I am sort of uh, always knocked to the floor because you say, come on, this has been realized. So when you get depressed, especially for a chemist, you look at the table and say, oh, we did something. <laughs> and indeed, this is the playground of chemists. Chemists are like children playing Lego. The Lego are these elements and we play with them. We put them together, we cut them apart, we build nice buildings. We make an Ateneum out of them and things of that kind. So that's the playground of chemistry. So this is now, these are the bricks of matter, the one we are made of. 
What about transforming matter? Here I can cite Lavoisier, who said, rien ne se perd. I'm sorry, my Romanian is inexistent, but French is the closest I can come to Romanian. <laughs> rien ne se perd, rien ne se crée, tout se transforme. That means, in fact, that you have elements, you mix them, they are still the same elements, but they are rearranged and they make all kinds of interesting chemi chemical objects. And this rule is the basis of the chemical reaction. Without this, you cannot do chemistry. This rule is that the elements are conserved, but they are rearranged, recombined. So after having looked at this, let's now ask another question. Is matter just a composition? Just so much carbon, so much hydrogen, so much oxygen, so much nitrogen, and so on. People then began, also in the middle of the 19th century, to ask the question, maybe these things are linked together in a given way. That is a graphical representation, that's a graph, which, which says that a carbon is linked to so much of this, so much of that, and so on. And so there were many Structural formulas were presented. I showed just three here of the way to represent that. Wurz uh, in, in Paris on the top, Kekulé in Germany on the bottom. They are not wrong, but they are quite far from what we use today. What today we use is much closer to what Loschmitz proposed in Austria. He said he used a big circle for a carbon a small circle for H, a double circle for oxygen, and this is quite impressive because, for instance, a chemical of great interest, ethanol, you know ethanol, you have good wine here, you have ethanol in it, that's ethanol. Nowadays, you make it like that, CH3, CH2OH, is alcohol, that is correct. And so, this is then was the step for, uh, not, nowadays we use this representation, because a big circle, that a big circle can be big or smaller, but if you put C, H, 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 C, H, H, and O, and H, that's ethanol. And we use now the letters rather than circles, which would make things much more complicated. So, now we have made a step. We know that these elements which make up matter are connected, they have connectivity. And this connectivity follows rules which I don't want to get into, but uh, rules which every chemist knows. Then, the next step is to realize that beyond the composition and then the connectivity, there's another property. This connectivity is direct correspond to the, they are just a connectivity, but molecules these entities are objects which have a shape, which have a shape due to the fact that the atoms are linked together in a given way, given angles and so on. And this was realized first independently by two chemists, Van Hoff in the Netherlands and Lebel in France in 1874. Totally independently, both arrived at the same conclusion. Uh, Van Toff was the one who got the first Nobel Prize in chemistry. He did a lot of other things. In fact, he got it for something else. So it wasn't so bad, though. <laughs> and Lebel, he had the same intuition. Lebel was, uh, he was uh, from a rather rich family. He could do chemistry on his own, which many chemists here are dreaming of, having enough money not to have to ask for a grant, isn't it? And he had, uh, they were, his family was the uh, owner of uh, the first uh, oil wells in France, in Alsace, in Pechelborn, and with that money he could go around and he worked with Wurz and so on. Anyway, there's now one more property I must cite, in addition to this shape of molecules. Since we talk about life, there's one property which molecules have, which is very important why in living systems, that is what Pasteur first explained, what is called chirality. Chirality is the fact that molecules can be like a left hand or a right hand. That means the image with one another respect to symmetry plane. 
And in living system, when a molecule is this way, it is not this way. And so living systems and many molecules, not all, but many molecules in life, in living systems, have this property of being chiral. Chiral comes from the Greek kairos, which means hand. So this was, of course, a very, very, very quick look through the history. There are many, many other people on good side. There are books in volumes and volumes of the history of chemistry, science, of course, but chemistry in particular. And so we will stop here at the history and look then at this way, this pathway from the atom to the molecule, the way you combine atoms, bricks, to make molecules, houses, out of these bricks, and this is the chemistry of molecules, molecular chemistry, art and science of how to arrange elements in complex architectures to build them up. And this uses, now this is a bit technical, but it's easy to understand, it uses strong interactions between elements, chemists call that covalent bonds, which is like holding them together, huh? like nuts and screws, and they stick together very strongly, covalent bonds. And two milestones, just to give an idea of the development. First of all, in 1829, 1828, a German chemist, Friedrich Wöhler, made in the laboratory urea, a very simple molecule. It has two nitrogens, here, two nitrogens, four hydrogens, one carbon here, and one oxygen, very simple. But he made it from a chemical substance whose name is ammonium cyanate in the laboratory. Now, first it was a scientific achievement. He made one molecule from another one. He transformed ammonium cyanate into urea. Okay, fine. But more importantly even, and that is also a way in which one can see how progress of knowledge changes your view of metaphysics, of what is around. Because at that time, people were thinking that in order to make any molecule contained in a living organism, you needed some magical force called the vital force, force vital. And uh, Wöhler very much realized that the fact that he could transform in the laboratory ammonium cyanide into urea, which is contained in urine itself for a living organism, was no difference. That means it's all our molecules, it's chemistry, and there is no abyss between living systems and non-living systems. In fact, he knew that very well because he wrote to Bercelius a famous letter where he said, I was able to transform ammonium cyanate into urea without the help of any animal being man or dog. So, now let's jump. 150 years, and now this over there is a vitamin B12. That's a vitamin which we have in our organism, a much, much more complicated molecule than urea, very complicated one. In the beginning 70s of last century, 1975 around, two groups, headed one by Robert Burns Woodward at Harvard in the USA, and the other one by Albert Eschenmoser at the Polytechnical School in Zurich, they collaborated to progressively, painstakingly, but very elegantly, put together all the atoms needed in the right position to generate vitamin B12. It took about, I have not exactly the, the, the number, but it must have taken something like 20 people for 10 years, that means, let's say 200 years, all together to make this. And uh, in many steps, about 80 steps along the way. I was at that time postdoc with Woodward in 63, 64. That's my piece there. <laughs> that is not to brag, not to say, ah, that's my piece. No, it just shows, and this is especially valid for the young students, high school people here. When you are a scientist, you contribute to the construction of an enormous enterprise. You, cook, you, you contribute to this enterprise and you bring a stone. 
Some stones are bigger than other ones, but it's your stone. Nobody take it away from you. And so I think this is a way sort of to collaborate. I was one in these many people who contributed. It happened that the piece I made was incorporated in the final one, but before you could do that, many other people had gone other ways in the same groups and had not found the right way, and you start again from the beginning and so on. So it's very hard work, but it succeeded. So, after that, which was considered the Himalaya of uh, the art and science of making complicated molecules, molecular chemistry continued, and many new reactions were discovered, many new objects were made, materials, properties, all that. And nowadays, one probably would not make vitamin B12 the same way as it was done uh, 40 years ago, 45 years ago. So, then the question comes, okay, molecular chemistry is strong, it's an adult science, it develops, has, will continue to develop. What else should we be interested in? Let's have a look. What you see here is a cancer cell, the blue sphere, and two killer cells. The killer cells are cells which are sort of the police force. They go around your organ, as you're sitting here, they go around and try to find out what goes wrong. And if they find a cell which is, has gone wrong, a transformed cell, they have to destroy it. But they should not make a mistake. If the killer cell makes a mistake, either it does not destroy a cancer cell, or it, does, it destroys a healthy cell, no good. How do they know? Here you have a white blood cell, artificially colored in rose, and the blue dots is HIV virus particles. When the HIV virus particle hits the white blood cell, it can infect. What tells the virus that it has reached the goal and now can go into the cell? So something must happen between these bodies. These big things, of a big compared to a molecule, are made of a membrane and inside is what is inside the cell. This membrane defines the object and in this membrane there are molecules sticking in the membrane and it's the touching between the molecules present in the killer cells and the mo molecules expressed by the cancer cell which tells the killer cell that guy is a cancer cell and then it can destroy it. That means something very important that the chemistry happening in a molecule is succeeded by a chemistry of what happens between molecules. And this is what we called supramolecular chemistry, a chemistry beyond the molecule, which deals with what happens when molecules get together, when they talk to each other, when they touch each other. It's like a population, and that is why I sometimes call that molecular sociology. What do molecules do when they get together? They love each other, they hate each other, they act on each other, and so on. And there you use another type of forces. Okay, for physicists it's all the same, the forces. But for chemists, we, use them, we call them differently. They are the ways in which objects sort of touch each other and sort of are able to have an interaction with the other body. And the three main features which were studied over the years were how do molecules recognize each other? How can they act on each other to react, to transform one another? And how can they carry somebody or another type of molecule through a membrane, like a cell membrane? Recognition is the basis of that. How do molecular objects recognize each other? And this is very, very important because all biological functions start with a recognition at some stage. Because molecules have to know what to do. And you would not exist if there would not be a recognition process at the beginning which tells the molecules where to go, what to do, and so on. So this recognition requires, first of all, that molecules feel each other, that is binding, interactions. But that is not enough. Go to the, in the street, somebody tells you, yes, you go to the airport, somebody comes and you want to know the person. You need information to recognize the person. So, for molecules to recognize each other, they need information. 
Without information, you have no recognition, which means that chemistry also involves information. And one way of figuring this out, of proposing how it works, is that there's a sort of a complementarity in shape, in geometry, and in interactions. The way they interact, as you, most of you certainly know, plus attracts minus, plus repels plus. Very simple. Of course, nowadays we know it's much more complicated, but the basis, uh, the basis is correct. And the simplest way, the simplest strong image, very simple, there's a take-home message, if you remember that, you know a lot of things. Like Schloss and Schlüssel, they have to fit together like a lock and the key. This was in 1894, published in a paper by Emil Fischer, very famous German chemist, when he was studying the way in which biological uh, reagents, enzymes, act on cell substrates. They have to fit together like Schloss and Schlüssel. And here is Emil, and he got his PhD in Strasbourg, 1874. At that time, we were German. We had these wars in the past. We had too many wars in Europe. I hope that now we are Europeans. So we annex Emil Fischer also to Strasbourg. <laughs> so, the most important recognition process is this one. You are not a tomato. Why are you not a tomato? Because of that. Why is a bacteria not an elephant? Because of that. What is it? It's the genome of living organisms. And it's, for the chemist, it's a trivial object. It's much simpler in terms of its structure than vitamin B12 in complexity. It's a long, long, long strand of uh, rather simple chemistry. There's a sort of a sugar-like, and then you have a phosphate, and it's just a long, long chain. But then, in this chain, are sticking letters. Chemists have given names to these letters. This group here is adenine. This group here is guanine. This one is thymine, and this one is cytosine. For a chemist, these groups are very simple. It's a simple object, a simple chemical object. But these four letters write the genome of all living organisms. It's a very, very long strand, and the sequence determines the information present. Seems very simple. Why not more? Why just four? Possibly because it was enough, and we come back to that. Now, something else about steps towards life. If you look at one of those letters, adenine, one realizes that it is just five HCN molecules linked together. You can see here, they're a bit rearranged, but you have, for instance, HCN, HCN, and you rearrange a little, it's 5-HCN. HCN is present in interstellar space, adenine is present in interstellar space. So all these molecules can form one another. And it's sort of astonishing that for, uh, there must be a reason that there may be HCN, there's a lot of it, and it may then adenine, and adenine, once adenine is formed, okay, then something else happens, some water, then you get guanine, some other transformation, you get the two other letters. And the result of it is that you can very simply, from very simple chemistry, in fact, terribly, trivially simple compared to what we try to do in the labs now, deduce the molecules which make living systems. Now, how do you read this information? It's not enough to store it, but you have to read it. The reading is just by touching. The letter adenine, A, interacts with uracil or thymine by two points of interactions, represented by these little dots. Guanine and cytosine by three. What is that? Two, three, two, three. A binary system. It's enough. And again here, possibly the evolution just was happy with that. Four letters, two combinations, that's enough to store and to read. And it's quite possible that maybe there have been attempts to introduce other letters, like now some chemists are doing, 
artificial letters into the genomes. But uh, perhaps it was very chaotic and you needed more recognition pieces and so on. So, four, two by two, four letters, two pairings, it's enough for working. In fact, our computers, they just do the same, zero, one, zero, one, huh? very simple, binary system. So chemistry is not just the science of the uh, structure and transformation of matter, but it's an information science. The molecular information is stored in the molecule as such, the shape, the nature, the structure, and the, this is processed by touching, which is supramolecular. So the storage is molecular, the reading and processing is supramolecular. Now, how did we come to that? What brought me to this thing? My initial motivations, you will be surprised, had nothing to do much with that. I was interested in neurochemistry. Because, you know, the nervous system is what makes us. Huh? Without the nervous system, uh, we are bacterium perhaps, but we don't go much further. Uh, we don't discover E equal MC squared huh? when you are bacterium. I don't. That's, it's not known in the, in the society of bacteria that they have found, or they have solved an integral or, whatever, or so on. So neurochemistry seemed to me as one of those fantastic goals. And, uh, but you know, as a chemist, you wonder, how can you gain the field like that? It's very complicated. You may have to study, start your studies again. But there was something. The propagation of the nerve influx is in fact relying on a rather simple type of activity, which is the action potential. The action potential is what brings information along the nerve axis, axon, and it relies on changes of concentration of two rather simple chemicals, sodium ions and potassium ions, which go through the membrane and then propagate along the nerve. So, that seemed very interesting, that seemed for a poor chemist something one can deal with. And so the question was, can one selectively bind, catch, and carry sodium potassium across a membrane. How can I do that? And using Emil Fischer's type of approach, if these three are keys, if the middle is the lock, it's quite obvious that the, the, the red key fits into the lock. So, I said, okay, let's play the game of locks and keys. It didn't historically, I mean, the way we developed it wasn't exactly like that, but I tried to sort of rationalize it. So very many studies have been done in many laboratories trying to understand how what recognition occurs, how I can build locks for keys or keys for locks. And among the simplest object in three-dimensional space are spheres. And in the periodic table, the Mendeleev periodic table, there is one nice series of spheres, which are the alkali metal cations, where sodium potassium are sitting there, and sodium chloride is kitchen salt, very trivial kind of stuff. So sodium potassium are close to sitting next to one another in this series of five spheres of same charge, one plus, but of different diameters, and so the question was, can one make locks for these keys? Can one bind selectively and transport these ions through membranes and therefore perform spherical molecular recognition? So in 19, that's a long time ago, in 1967, 68, um, two of my PhD students made these cages on top, this is the lock, so to say. Yeah. It's a cage which has a cavity, like a, a lock at the door has a cavity where the, key, where the key goes in. And these are designed so that it has a cavity which is sort of spherical and can then pick up the spheres. That's why we call them cryptans, like crypts, and cryptates is the object form afterwards. So the smallest one is good for lithium, the smallest cation. This one is sodium, this one is potassium. This work was done by Bernard Dietrich and Jean-Pierre Sauvage, and he got the Nobel Prize just two years ago for something totally different. So that was an interesting start. And of course, these objects which chemists make 
have also some aesthetic features. And in a place like that, I should talk a little bit about art also. So this I call the primordial cryptate, the first one we made. Looks nice, but it can even be nicer when an artist, a chemist turned artist, uses it to make this. This has been made by Bela Visi, a Hungarian chemist from the University of Esprem, and I, I like it very much. It's a very nice piece. And, but he has a lot of inspiration, and I show you four more. I will only discuss one more. Here are four other things, sculptures he made. And top right, this one, it looks like a sort of a aroma coming out. It's called the scent of rose. And when you smell a rose, there's a dominant molecule in all roses, which is for chemists here, phenyl ethyl alcohol. Let me show you for the chemist. That's the phenyl, CH2, CH2, OH. Very nice. Huh? I have shown this to people, artists who are not chemists. They like it very much, and they don't bother about whether or not this phenyl is alcohol. But uh, this was one of the cases. And also the dancers over there, also some other properties, other molecules, and so on. So let's summarize a bit. 1828, molecular chemistry. And this then led to the synthesis of these locks for keys, uh, receptors. 1978, I proposed that name, supermolecular chemistry, which then led from the receptor, binary substrate, to supermolecular entities, which then perform these functions, recognition, transformation, translocation, and make functional entities. OK, it's just to give a sort of a rundown, a summary. And many laboratories, including, of course, in Romania, in many countries, most countries in the world have studied this type of features and try to understand better and better how molecular recognition and the subject, subsequent functions occur. So what about some applications? What is it good for? Of course, as I usually say, first of all, you have to know. Basic research is acquiring knowledge. Without knowledge, you can't do much. But nevertheless, despite the fact that we have always been most interested in basic science, we have also always, always paid attention to possible applications. First of all, molecular recognition is the basis of drug design, drug discovery. A drug, a pharmaceutical, is a key for a biological lock. It is supposed to bind to the biological lock and to do something, inhibit or amplify the action. So for pharma pharmaceutical discoveries and in pharma companies, understanding molecular recognition is really basic for designing drugs. Second one, there was another one I will show you in a moment. Some application has come out for medical diagnostics, for gene transfer and biomaterials. Another type of crypt, which has something in the hole, was designed over the years. It was quite different. It's for chemists, they know what it is. It's just a skin, an organic skin, and inside the molecule, one now puts another member of the periodic table, which is europium. And this, when this sits in the cavity, it begins to shine red light. And this can then be used as sort of a nano-sized bulb, red bulb, you can attach to immunoproteins to make detection systems for different kinds of sicknesses. And this is then um, a, a medical diagnostic apparatus which was developed by Gérard Matisse at CIS Bio International, a French startup which has now changed name and so on. Now it's called CISAN. And that is uh, this apparatus which is used now in many hospitals, about half a thousand of them being used in hospitals. Now, the third property of interest is to help um, objects go through a membrane, a barrier. And this uh, is uh, a way in which you can pick up selectively a uh, substrate and help it to go into a cell. We have studied that quite extensively in the beginning of the 1970s and then we have dropped it because we had done quite a lot of things. But then came up again later on this idea that what about gene transfer, 
to modify genes. And what does it mean? It means that you want to take a piece of DNA, a section, a piece of DNA, a gene, and help it to go into the cell, so that in the cell it can go to the nucleus and then undergo all the kind of feature of processes that occur to generate finally the protein, the, the end product. And to do that, there are two approaches. One is biological, using viruses, but that I don't want to get into. And the other one is to make synthetic molecules capable of enveloping the DNA piece and help it to go into the cell. DNA doesn't want to get into the cell because it has to cross the membrane. The membrane is like a soap bubble. It doesn't like to have these polar things which are water soluble to go through. And so you have to make compounds which can help the piece of DNA to go into the cell. And this is interesting and has been studied by many groups uh, for biotechnology and also for gene therapy. Now, gene therapy is now a, a process which is advancing quite well, but it is also important for biotechnology. In other words, we're doing something which some people jump up when you talk about genetically modified organisms. And here I want to state very strongly that genetically modified organisms are here to stay and will be used more and more and there's absolutely no danger and all these frightened people who run around and say, don't modify it, geez, it's just a piece of Lego. And you work on it and you can transform, you can express other genes, you can repress genes and new technologies have appeared. Just I want here to state very clearly that my personal conviction is that gene modification, genetically modified organisms will be developed more and more and the future, there will be more and more. And nobody will be able to stop it, even if you think so. <laughs> now, the, same, the other thing is, uh, what about materials? So another thing which I just also illustrates also how applications can come out of science. We had, in 1990, proposed a new class of polymers, which we call su uh, supramolecular polymers that kind of polymers coming from supermolecular chemistry. And it took, well, it was developed, we developed it, and some of the people, especially a laboratory in Holland, that of Bert Meyer in Eindhoven, and uh, so on, it developed quite well. And suddenly, in 2013, I got an email from the CEO of Xeltis company, a small company, which had developed supramedical polymers into biocompatible polymers, which could be used for the surgical treatment of children having a severe congenital cardiac malformation. They developed that, and here is the first little girl who got the implantation, got the repairing of the heart. That is Dominica and Professor Leo Bocchieria, a well-known surgeon, in uh, pediatric cardiovascular surgery in uh, Bakulev Scientific Center for Cardiovascular Surgery in Moscow. And uh, this was a big breakthrough, and of course for us it was fantastic to know that a type, this Geltis developed, of course, modified the compounds that initially proposed, but the concept was the same, and this was now used, more than 10 children have been now implanted, maybe 15, I don't know how many, this slide is a bit earlier. And more recently also, they have developed uh, hard valves, which have been implanted, maybe now more than what is shown here, two in Budapest and one in Krakow. This is a more difficult thing than if you have just the implantation of, a, of a, a wall in the heart, this is a static thing. But valves, they have to work, and it seems to be fine too. It's, a, it's more complicated. Anyway, so this was very nice and we made us very happy. Furthermore, you realize that it took 23 years to come from the initial paper which described these classes of compounds to an application in this case. Of course, sometimes it goes faster, but when you want to introduce something in a human being, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of steps to go through and it takes time takes money, takes people who are convinced that they can put, they can bet their shirt on it, 
You have to pay their shirt at some stage. You don't know where you are going. And you have to find also the surgeon who is ready to do it. So this is considered as a breakthrough in surgical practice. Now, another property of this supramedical type of materials is that because the connections between the pieces, the components, are rather weak, non-covalent forces, if you cut them, they can reform. And here is a transparent film, which you see here, transparent film. You cut it with scissors, you superimpose the two ends, and you press with your finger, and you have reconstruction, heating of the film, and it can be stretched again. And this is also an area where uh, these supramedical type of properties can be very interesting, making self-heating materials. Now, let's go back to the main line, which is, what about self-organization? Because my conviction is self-organization is driving the universe, of a, is driving the organized universe. So, once you understand better molecular recognition, you can hope that you can design systems which will progressively build up and spontaneously on the basis of the interactions between the pieces. And this then uh, uh, asks the question, can we make systems which self-organize? Systems which are able to generate a more complex entity from the pieces which go together and then develop into a higher a structure of higher complexity. This is done sort of a, you try to put information in the molecule, you try to understand how to do it, then how you can read this information on the molecular, supramolecular level, and then to try to have uh, the use of these recognition patterns to get self-organization and to have information <coughs> control complex architectures. And one, uh, one uh, illustration of that is in uh, the case of the build-up of a virus. Viruses are not living. A virus is living only when it penetrates into the cell because it cannot reproduce outside the cell. So the virus is a sort of just at the limit, at the bridge of between non-living and living matter. And if you look at one of the viruses, the first one which was well understood, the tobacco mosaic virus, it is a construction of a sort of a tower, helical tower, built of 2,130 protein subunits here, and they are shaped in sh like a piece of cake, and they are shaped so that if you put them together, they have to do this, to go around, and so they progressively build up, do that, build the tower. Inside the hole in the middle is the, uh, are the uh, genome of the virus, and on the right-hand side, for the chemists or biologists, you have more detailed structural representation of these pieces. Now, this looks like magic, but it's not magic. We understand everything that is happening here. It's simple structural chemistry, interaction between entities, physical chemistry, we can call analytical chemistry, or at least even the domains of chemistry. But it looks like magic. Now, to shoot, to, it's very interesting because it looks like one of those things which is unbelievable. But there's an interesting, you can find on the internet, a movie made by uh, young people from a laboratory in uh, California, in the West Coast, the US, and they did the following. There are some viruses which are spherical, and which are built from molecules, proteins, which go together to build up a sphere, no? carrot, of, uh, molecular having this convex shape. So what they did, they took plastic pieces, which had this sort of spherical shape, not spherical, I mean this uh, convex shape, shape, and put at the positions where they get together to build the uh, spherical virus, little magnets. Then to put them into uh, into a bas uh, basket, or, and you shake. And after a few minutes, you have a sphere. Then they went one step further. They took red um, plastic 
peak. These are plastic things which are centimeters big. Huh? It's nothing to do with uh, these small organisms. So red ones and green ones of different, little bit different size. You put them again together and you shake. In that case, they use the shaker automatic because it takes more time. In 20 minutes, you have a green sphere and a red sphere. 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And you can even see that as the process goes on, sometimes you have a green piece with a green piece. No, not that. Nothing about green piece. We can discuss that later. I call that green war. Okay, so you have this um, green entities <laughs> which bind to the red entities and then they destroy again. So you have mixtures, errors made, but at the end, the right ones come out. So this is a program chemical system. And just to give you some illustration of one thing, in this program chemical system, the program, this means the information is in the molecule and the operation is at the supramolecular level, the way they get together. And one example I can give you, a sort of one category, deals with organic molecules able to bind to metal ions, like iron, or cobalt, or nickel, or silver, or copper, and so on. And uh, these then can be designed in such a way that they will generate on purpose, a given entity, given architecture. And here, uh, first of all, a way to make double helical entities, which are nothing to do with DNA, but have the same shape. Of course, it, the sizes are quite different. This molecule, the DNA is bigger than the other ones, but on the left-hand side, you have a perfect double helix, and here in the middle, you have a triple helix. Here you have three you have strands which are linked together by metal ions which sort of bind them together. You can also make lots of nice objects. This screen is very nice for the colors. So. <laughs> um, you have a, there you have a grid, a grid where molecules are more or less perpendicular to one another and held together by the little balls, which are silver in that case. That's a nano cylinder where you have flat molecules in blue linear molecules in red, and here you have then these uh, middle lines which hold them together. On the bottom, some other circular architectures. In fact, the one on the right was made by this person sitting in the front row here, who had some role in your government at some stage. <laughs> See, it's bad when you talk about politics. <laughs> so, but this is now, this has been done, and uh, many more complicated molecules have been made. Architectures have been made, and uh, for instance, Fraser Stoddard, who got also the Nobel Prize at the same time as Jean-Pierre Sauvage, they made a lot of complicated objects, even more complicated than those. So, this type of approach, where the system generates order, so to say, organization, can also be of great interest in nanoscience and nanotechnology, because uh, this is, you program this organization, and so you can progressively come to more and more complex objects stepwise, but if it's well designed, it can, you can at least hope that it can be done successively on the basis of how it's constructed. So each step will prepare the stage for the next one. And therefore you can hope that it will be possible in the future. It does also, already steps can be done, but in the future to go from the need to make fabrication to self-fabrication. In fact, you know, it's an easy way to convince you, although uh, we are very far from it. The best computer we have is the one between our two ears. Um, that's the best computer still. Maybe it will change, but for the moment, it's still the best computer. It's self-organized. You don't make it. So we have to understand how this works. And in 100, 200, 300 years, I would like to come back to see how it works. So, self-organization, let me just give you just a hint on what we are doing now to see the next step, because we have steps towards life. So we have recognition, they get together, you control that. If it works, if you can understand better, you can make these simple self-organizations where you design the bricks, where they get together, the way you want them to get together. But then the next step is to make the system such, make it able 
to select the pieces it needs. And this is done, self-organization with selection, where you have a, a bunch of different bricks, and the system is able to select from this diversity of shapes and structures the ones it needs to build up its final architecture. For that, you need diversity in the building blocks, but you also need something important, dynamics. You don't want your objects to do this and stick together because maybe the combination is not correct. That means you don't want the first collision to be too stable. So it has to go out and explore the possibilities that exist and then lead to the final compound. This then led to the development of what we call in this, maybe for your horrible name, constitutional dynamic chemistry. What it means is the following. In this type of chemistry, one considers the constitution of the chemical object as breakable and rearrangeable, recombination possible. So it can, the constitution of the object can break apart, reform, but maybe differently if the conditions have changed. So it's a system which responds to changes in the environment or some other kind of changes. And that leads then to what is now our major research area. Chemistry can adapt, where the objects you study can adapt to changes in conditions that respond to external solicitations. So this is uh, then also used for can, new ways of searching for biologically active substances, that means for drugs. You can make dynamic nanostructures, dynamic materials, which can have these properties of being self-healing, responsive, adaptive, and so on. This is just to give you a very brief, brief rundown of what is now the objective. So, Chemistry starts with molecular. First thing we have to do as chemists is to know how to build up things, to learn the rules of making things, build them up progressively and as efficiently as possible. Efficiently meaning, with no, this is also something which chemists have done all the time. They are accused of a lot of things, chemists. Poor guys, poor, poor girls. Because, you know, it's, we have always tried that, to have the least use of matter the smallest use of energy and the lowest uh, loss of uh, uh, material. So this has always been the goal of chemistry. And indeed, this molecular chemistry is developing and tries to obey to these, um, let's say, to these rules, making it more and more efficient. Supramolecular chemistry comes next. You study how things get together. Then, this get organized. I have shown you some of that. Then dynamic, they can break apart, come back, break apart, come back, recombine, and so on. Then adaptive, and of course other steps come later. At such stage, there are steps towards living matter. Now before I finish, I would like to make some general comments. Chemistry is a science where you want to understand, of course, what already exists, the molecules of nature. But you can also make molecules which never existed. That is why one can consider that the essence of chemistry is to create novel expressions of complex matter, entities which never existed. Of course, it's not very impressive. You don't see this thing. But you know it's a new thing which has never been made before. So the book of chemistry has to be written, not just to be read. And the score of chemistry has to be composed, not just to be played. So chemistry has creative power, which again I can sort of uh, represent by a piece of art. Again, Rodin, I like this guy very much, I like his sculptures, you have seen that already. Rodin, as you can see here, the hand of the sculpture expresses out of the stone a sculpture which is not in the stone. The stone doesn't. No, the stone has nothing to do with the sculpture, but the hand of the artist makes it. And so, in this way also, chemistry is the art of matter. It's the art of making objects which did not exist before you conceived them. This is, in fact, not, not so recent because somebody who is considered as an artist, a 
a scientist and an engineer, Leonardo da Vinci, wrote a very strong sentence, where nature finishes to produce its own species. We are part of that. Man begins using natural things. This, we can now say, is a periodic table of elements. Natural things are the elements present in the universe. In harmony with this very nature, this is the laws of physics. No? These are the way things get together. The all laws which control the construction. And then the ending is very strong to create an infinity of species. So, the universe, the perspective is wide open for developing more and more new entities and new creations in science. In this country not so far away, you had these gods sitting in the heaven and having knowledge. And one of them, he stole the fire of knowledge from the gods and gave it to mankind. As you can see here, he's running away, looking over his shoulder to see if the other people are not running after him to catch him before he could give it. But he didn't succeed in catching him, so he gave the fire of knowledge to mankind. And here, he shows it high. Now, there's however one thing, we cannot give it back. What you know, you cannot erase. What you know is there. You cannot just say, I forget what I know. No, 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 no. And yes, of course, if we destroy ourselves with atom bombs and so on, then our knowledge is gone. But otherwise, you cannot. So, our path will lead us from the quest of knowledge to the control of our own destiny. And I'm quite convinced of that. The natural evolution has produced human beings. But human beings will, at some stage, now take over. Hmm? Take over and continue on. It raises a lot of questions, but I'm convinced it will happen. In the past, information was transferred in this way, between the ape and the human being. Presently, you will recognize probably what I show you, this. You recognize, okay, uh, Michelangelo. What about the future? What do you guess? <laughs> uh, it's a bit joking, but it's not so joking. Because I'm sure in this room, they may have people who have uh, other lenses. They're modified. Maybe you have here some titanium in your hip. They're modified. You have some other teeth. You are modified. Of course, it doesn't touch some other things. But suppose you have a heart surgery and a transplantation of your heart. That's not your heart anymore. You cannot tell your wife, I give you my heart. It's not yours. <laughs> no, it's true. You have to realize that these things have occurred already. Of course, we have to be careful. When the health applications, usually people accept it easily. Other applications, other makes, uh, ways and possibilities of transformation, uh, they will happen. In fact, yeah, I almost became, I belong, but maybe I'll tell you that, I almost became a diplomat in biology when I was a student, because uh, the first lectures I had, among the first lectures in university, was a lecture, were well, lectures in, uh, in zoology, in um, animal biology, where the professor described the uh, work of Hans Spiemann in Germany. And this Hans Spiemann had shown that uh, when the neck develops, certain regions will give, for instance, the heart or the neural axis. And once you know that, before it's differentiated into a heart or into neural axis, he took cells and put them on the other side of the egg. The egg had two hearts. They, they, Animal had two hearts. Of course, it didn't live, but they were functional. So, if we understand better the way in which our Lego set, we are Lego sets, okay, complicated ones, I admit, but once we know better how this functions, we will be able to do it. And in some ways, one can sort of claim that in the future you don't need a transplantation anymore. You can make your heart. 
And Jamanaka, who got the Nobel Prize for stem cells, he made a mouse out of a skin cell of the mouse. Just a skin cell. Didn't need to have a female mouse and a male mouse. Skin cell, you make a mouse. Because all the genetic information is in the skin cell. But of course, because of development, it's repressed, it doesn't express itself. So if you can de-repress it, you have again all the possibilities. So, I have not said much about mathematics. Let me conclude with mathematics. Here is this, as an interesting, huh? has a nice hat. And he looks sort of deeply into his matter. This David Hilbert, a very famous mathematician. He is buried in Göttingen. Here is his tombstone. And in his tombstone, he wanted to have something written. There. What is it? We are müssen wissen. We must know. That's only the start. And then comes really, I would say, an, an act of conviction. You know, you have to hang on to it. We are better than wissen. We will know. And thanks to science, we will know. And for those in the room who listen and wonder what they will be doing in the future, science shapes the future of humanity. Participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Lane, for the beautiful lecture. And I think you added a huge value to the conferences, uh, to the series of conferences which are organized by uh, uh, Ateneo Roman. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, people enjoyed uh, uh, everything you, you presented here. And uh, I think we will take uh, several questions. Not so many, okay, because probably you will you offer. Stop before me. <laughs> yes, and uh, anyway, you probably you will uh, uh, you you have a surprise for us. So um, the, I open the session for questions from the audience. Ah, no. You are not allowed. No. To ask a question. You are not allowed. <laughs> you know too much about the thing. <laughs> Professor Dragos uh, Ciparo, and then uh, there. Okay, thank you, beautiful lecture. Thank you very much. Um, you say, you know, what's the driving force of this self-organization? Isn't it uh, thermodynamics? Yes, uh, sure. So it's minimizing the energy after all. That's what we're looking for. The what? The minimizing the energy of yeah, the but system. Yeah, no, it's more complicated, in fact. Self-organization at equilibrium is minimizing energy. That's somewhat dynamic equilibrium. But as you know, human beings are not in equilibrium. But they're still physical systems. We are all out of equilibrium. And our equilibrium state is water, and uh, nitrogen, ammonia, phosphate, and so on. Not very funny, huh? but that's what we are. Huh? Our thermodynamic equilibrium is this kind of very low-grade chemicals. <coughs> and so uh, this uh, out-of-equilibrium thermodynamics is something very important to make systems which have a driving force, which is building by reactions. And this is something which Wendt Prigogine has studied. And uh, this is in the future. It is very important to try to, try to implement it also in systems like that. The ones I showed, we have now also some systems which are out of equilibrium, but still very sort of primitive out of equilibrium. And okay, the other people uh, who are pretty good and uh, they develop, and young people here, time you start. Huh? 
Professor, thank you very much for your very, very interesting lecture. I have the following question. You mentioned that uh, you, you started thinking about uh, supramolecular chemistry starting from uh, uh, neuro neuroscience. Uh, what about smell? The Schloss und Schlüssel uh, rule, it's, it's, uh, it's not the key to explain smell. No, 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 it is, it is. The, uh, no, no, it is. The, uh, the um, smell is an interaction of molecules with a receptor. And then they have a, make a signal, and it's not simple, but artificial noses have been made for uh, detecting a specific, uh, specific, what you might call a smell. Of course, the instrument doesn't smell, but it detects, and we can smell. So a smell is also an affair of locks and keys. Sure. Yes, but there are, there are proofs that there are identical uh, uh, molecules which gives different smell. No, 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 no. So it's, it's two keys that, that, uh, that open uh, different locks. What can happen is that the two smells are so close together that you cannot distinguish them. But two different molecules don't give the same smell. It's, it's about the shape. I, yeah, I, I, shape. I, uh, I, I said the same, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's the same shape that gives different smells. Yes, so. it can be, but the shape is not alone, because you have different atoms, and these atoms have also different interactions. So, so you have, maybe you I have to, know, to, to go to, to, to quantum chemistry to, 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 to try to explain it. Yes, if you want, but it's even a bit more complicated, because if you have, a, let's see, a smell of a rose, as I said, is alcohol dominant, but the, the roses smell differently. And that is because there are other small molecules around which excite other receptors. And so it's a much more complex process because there are many interactions occurring and then the smell is somewhat different. So, other questions? So, I will take probably the last question. So from the new generation. Good, good, good. Uh, sir, I want to ask you if do you think uh, when we try to explain uh, things like prebiotic uh, um, environments yeah. for life, uh, we should change our philosophy of science because this would be a whole new level of uh, asking the question of doing science. Sorry, uh, could you repeat that? Do you think we will have to change our way uh, we, do, we, we do science or we think about science? Why? Because it's, uh, not, about, it's not reproducible. It's not like we will, will be able to reproduce life from, from scratch. No, it is reproducible. If you have the same conditions, the same thing will happen. And uh, the prebiotic science, the problem is that we can, and a um, number of laboratories working on that, we can have an idea and test it. In other words, see if a given se sequence of reactions, which one can do in the laboratory, follows a pathway which can lead to more and more complex entities. But we cannot prove that that is what happened, because we cannot go back. Yes, we, we, nor, we, nor can, we neither can go back nor uh, reinvent it from scratch. We, can, uh, we can't... Uh, um, go neither backwards nor restart the whole life system. No, we cannot go backwards, backward because it's... I'm, okay, you know, maybe someday you can... Yeah, maybe if we understand better how certain features of life we still don't understand can be generated, then we can make another form, but not necessarily ours. In fact, ours exists, so I don't think it's too interesting to do it again. It's to invent new ways of doing it. Thank you. Yeah, there are a lot of interesting questions there. Uh, let me just, uh, I want to make another comment. Just, um, how can self-organization and this complexity lead to new properties? And uh, the simple example I usually take is the following. 
It's very simple, but it sort of keeps a step. If you are a single molecule of water, H O H, water, in the gas phase, a single molecule cannot boil, cannot freeze, has no properties like that. A glass of water is still water, but it can boil, it can freeze, it has a refractive index, it has a viscosity. What's the difference? The molecules interact. So the simple fact that the isolated molecules have become a glass of water and the interaction between them has given them features which do not exist at the level of isolated molecules. So you cannot reduce the higher property to the level, but you can deduce them. From the properties, this is what now people call emergence. Huh? New properties emerge when complexity becomes bigger. And this very simple case of, a, a, of a, a liquid which can be transformed into a gas and back to a liquid, this indicates that uh, new properties appear by the simple fact that you have a condensed phase. Now, we are very far from a brain, of course, but it is, it is a step which shows that new properties appear which do not exist at the level below. Okay? There's another question. Lady, you have to take that one. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor, for the wonderful um, presentation. I would like to ask you a simple question. Do you think that uh, this complexity of the elements and molecules will generate the same kind of um, intelligence? I yes. mean, uh, Sorry, the same kind of intelligence or life? I mean, do you expect that on another planet the same elements will generate human beings similar with us? Uh, what, what is the driving force to the intelligence, to no, the it's thinking? A, it's an excellent question. It's so excellent that one cannot answer it. <laughs> but uh, what I would say is the following, is that I am convinced that there are so, so many exoplanets, so, so many where probably there are the same conditions as on Earth, that if one restricts the search to these planets, there's a good chance that there will be organisms made of the same type of molecules. As I said, the atoms will be the same, no way out. The connections between the atoms will be the same, no way out. But of course, depending on conditions, there may be other molecules, um, information storage. You know, it's difficult to be simpler than four letters and two, uh, two pairings. Very difficult. How do you make it simpler? I don't see it exactly. It's the simplest. So on other planets, there can be org living organisms which are different from us, but they will be based on the same type of physical properties. Now, what about intelligence? Now, this is uh, very, very far from that. Just have to define what is intelligence, and you have to, first thing is conscious. How are you conscious? And I have a, a good friend, in fact, he got the Nobel Prize in 1987, Suzumu Tonegawa, and he is now working in neuroscience, and he uh, sort of, have, we had a big discussion last year, 2009, 2000. 16, I guess, and about uh, what is conscience. And okay, there are things coming out that conscience is probably a state, of mo a state of molecular circuits which make them talk to each other. But you know, we are still far from that. It's, but I'm convinced that life can exist and very, very probably exists in many places around. We are not the only ones, we should be modest, but we are not so bad. <laughs> okay. Thank you. But sometimes you should be more reasonable, huh? I have a question. Um, Give me the fact that um, only certain ligands can bind only certain metal ions. Is there any chance that we could predict running out of supramolecular architectures one day? Yeah, doing what? Doing predict? 
could we predict running out of supermolecular architectures, new supermolecular architectures one day? Is that yes, a possibility? Uh, not really, but because after all, all living entities are built on nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates. And we are not running out of it because not only it's not the number of different combinations, but how many uh, protein is an enormous thing. In fact, this is something which also in some ways is uh, a limitation of na natural nature. Mm -hmm. Evolution uses always the same molecules. It has okay. started making proteins. So everything is proteins. And sometimes maybe there's too much parts in proteins which have no, uh, which could be different, yes. but okay, I mean, this has developed well, it exists, and we have to understand how it works, but there are other ways, uh, one thing, it, it, there can be strategies to produce properties which are different from the ones which evolution used, mm -hmm. and which may be more efficient. And isn't supermolecular chemistry one of them, somehow? Yeah, it's one part in yeah, science. Well, well. Again, we have to be modest, huh? We have <laughs> just a step. Just a step. Um, I was wondering, I know that every piece of matter that is created, it needs to be destroyed so that the elements are reused again to create something else. If we keep evolving and we create superorganisms, they might reach immortality, so they cannot be destroy destroyed anymore. So, how, how, what would we do with science after that? It would be like a flat evolution of science because we cannot do anything more to make it even more. I don't get evolved. your point exactly. <laughs> what? Sh should I repeat my question? Yeah. Every piece of matter that is created. Every what? Every piece of matter yeah. that is created. It's then destroyed. So we can reuse the elements from that matter to create a different oh, sure, type sure. of matter. Happens. That is yes. what happens. If we create superorganisms, they might reach a point of immortality. They can't be destroyed anymore. If you cre if you would create superhumans that would have super Yeah, I mean this is a bit science fiction. Huh? It's so a it's science not my fiction. domain, really. <laughs> but it's true that uh, things are created from other ones. And in fact, you know, I mean, that is all what we're doing. We are eating salads or rabbits or other things, and we feed on something else because we decompose it and reconstruct something else. So uh, this, uh, what is immortality? Okay, one can. All right, I don't know. Do you want to be immortal? That's perhaps another point. It must be very, very you know, it must be very boring after some time. <laughs> so uh, uh, maybe it's a good question, but I don't think there's an answer <laughs> right now, at least. Um, professor, I have a question. All this uh, speech you had um, was centered around supra supramolecular chemistry. So that is something beyond, right? So you spoke, you gave the impression that everything has a, a rooftop, something which is above everything. So do you, can, can you figure out what's, what's the father for all this orphan concept you were speaking about, like Schlüssel und Schloss? and so on, which govern the universe. Is there something beyond all this? Yeah, there are steps. Uh, as I said, you're in, sort of in complexity from atoms to make molecules. Then you consider what happens when molecules interact. And then you consider what happens when they choose their pieces and make a more complicated object. And uh, eventually, you have more and more, higher and higher, complexity, but uh, at the end, if you look at and then a virus, a virus, as I said, is a bunch of molecules. It's not living. And then, when it goes into a cell, it uses part of the machinery of the cell to generate, to reproduce 
and then it's living. No? You need to reproduce and transfer your own information. And so uh, the viruses and this kind of biological objects, which are not living objects, but of high complexity, they give us a clue to what are the steps, what is, what is needed for living systems. But I think, you know, thinking is much more complicated even. No? Living, we are getting there, sort of, progressively, but thinking, that's another piece of cake. Be kind enough to allow uh, Daniel Funerio to ask uh, the questions. <laughs> really? What an honor, Mr. Welcome. Academician. Uh, Professor Len, um, I have yes, a very, uh, having gone through all the chemistry over the years, um, I guess there's an important question which not only me but many people uh, think about. What do you see the role of a scientist in a society to be? Because it is obvious for all of us that historically we run from phases where uh, science is bringing humanity forward, but then obscurantism comes back and then science slips forward again. So we are always evolving between these two cycles of humanity. And um, I, for one, would very much like to hear your comments about what you think today is and shall be the role of the scientist, of a scientist within the society. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, mankind is not as advanced as the brain can be. And we still have the old brain, the paleo brain, and when that takes over, then we react like low grade animals. Not too good. The role of science, I would say, we are, are, we are scientists are technicians also. They do, they are, they, are, they are competent in what they know how to do. They are biologists, they are physicists, they are chemists, and so on. But the approach is what is science can bring, and I hope it will bring, but it's an act uh, really of hope that it can bring to society the rational thinking, the fact that uh, you try to go beyond, uh, I mean, down to earth emotion. I have nothing against emotions, but emotions should not lead. Emotions can be very easily sort of uh, completely uh, taken away from the way, from the, the final goal. And so uh, emotions have something to do with chemicals. Huh? When, when you get angry, that's adrenaline. Huh? discharge of adrenaline, you get angry. Transmission of nerve influx, all this is uh, molecules. So one has to learn that it exists and we have to try to use the scientific approach, a sort of rational thinking, and should not only be rational because then you have you know, music, although music is quite rational too. Uh, so uh, science has a very important role in society in trying to try to uh, have an approach to, system, to life where you think before you run into it. And there's too much. Uh, if you look at the fact what he said, obscurantism comes back, it is true. Right? Lots of things where people get afraid, where people think that it's time to stop this, and uh, like, let's take vaccination. Some people don't want vaccination. Genetically modified organism. Some people don't want genetically modified organisms. But all this is hangs together and you have to, and we have in France now introduced the precautionary principle into the constitution. This for me is terrible. Because what is a precaution? To, if you, okay, people who like, who like it, they will contest it, but my, view of that is the following. You stand on one side of the street, you won't go to the other side of the street to cross. Normally, you look left, look right, nothing coming, you go. Precautionary principle, you never cross the street. Because there's always this very, very small chance that suddenly a big truck is happening boom, and runs you over. And this makes me also think that the worst invention of mankind, the most dangerous, is the invention of the wheel. All car accidents come from that. 
No wheel, no car accidents. And the next thing, perhaps the final, if you... Nature has given us hands. Hmm? You can caress or you can strangle. It depends what you want to do with it. Yeah, the chest punching. Just a small thing. Yeah. Now, before you leave, I want to give you one sign of my conviction, and you will recognize what it is. sound. <laughs> so, you got what you wanted? Just one question, with the question asked about uh, what science can bring to society. I think in Europe we have done something fantastic. We are trying to build up a community of 27 countries without weapons. The Romans had an empire, but it was with weapons. We are trying to do it without. So I think we should all try to do this, to get together in a peaceful way, trying to understand each other, keeping our, our essence, ourselves. Romanians are not French, and that is very nice. Huh? We have different cultures, different, but we should learn that we are trying to build up something which has never been realized before that in the history of mankind. So please stick together. <laughs>